We're going to have um, the founder of the Institute of Noetic Sciences and the, the sixth man to walk on the moon, Edgar, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, to come up now. Um, Edgar, can you give us a little um, informal sense of what's happening here in the latest cutting edge work that's going on in inner and outer space? That's Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Can you hear me with this? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm going to start out uh, speaking to the young people to begin with because there's some history with all of this that I think is important. And perhaps you more adult people will get something out of it also, but I'm sure that the younger people really need some background because we're talking some rather strange things. Now, I don't, <coughs> I don't have the pretty pictures to put up that uh, Colin used or anything like it because I didn't know what I was going to be doing here today <laughs> except talking to you. So that's what I will do. <clears throat> I'd like to start out with you young people to, with a little history. And my beginning history is to point out from my own life <clears throat> that my great-grandparents went across after our Civil War in the 1870s from South Georgia to West Texas to start a new life. And they went in covered wagons, pulled by horses. A few had a cattle to start a new life. Railroads weren't complete across the South and the West. Automobiles had not yet been invented. Light bulbs hadn't been invented. My father was born shortly after the Wright brothers made the first flight. And I went to the moon. Now think about that for a minute. In less than a hundred years, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, we transitioned from covered wagons horseback, camelback, ostrichback, whatever, <laughs> to spacecraft and leaving the planet altogether in less than 100 years. Now think about what that means. In all the thousands of years that our history records, we have been on this planet and evolving <clears throat> and doing what we do only in the last hundred, hundred and 50 now, getting to the space age. Only in the last 150, for you young folks, have we created the technologies. You want that one, please? Have we? Okay, thank you. Okay, good enough. <laughs> have we created the science and the technologies that have that have? help us to accomplish the current lifestyles. And that's what I want to speak to a little bit. I'm leading to up to what Colin is telling you about and what we have experienced that blows us away. We don't understand. We're just babes in the woods trying to understand some phenomena about the universe that we live in that we don't understand. And I will say, <clears throat> we think we're pretty smart. Our technology has advanced enormously in the last hundred years. And frankly, we're just ba barely out of the trees. And I feel privileged to have been one of those, the first generation to have left this planet and begun to explore our nearest neighbor, the moon, which is just the beginning. Now, let me put this in a larger context, too because all of this is a matter of context, where we've been, what we're experiencing right now, and where we're going tomorrow and in the next few years. That is crucial to all of us, and particularly you young people in this audience, it's your generation that's gonna to have to pick up the ball and run with it at this point in time. 
And let me paint the largest picture. Yes, I've been off this planet, and I've had the privilege of looking back at this tiny little speck we call Earth and seeing it as a little speck, and it blows you away. It's magnificent to see this Earth and to see it in the heavens, and I will relate that for you in just a minute. But let's jump way ahead, try to put all of this in context first. If when you study some astronomy, or maybe you've already studied some, and you've learned a little bit about solar systems, and a little bit about planetary formations, and a little bit about mainstream stars, because our sun is a mainstream star, and you realize that these mainstream stars have a life span of about 10,000, 10 billion years, and that's what most of these billions of stars that you see out here, called mainstream stars, they go through a particular path of physical development with a lifespan of about 10 to 12 billion years. And our star is about halfway through its billion years, its 10 billion years. So we've got another 5 billion years or so life on this star. That seems like a long time, but in geologic time, it's not very long. And that we're going to have to be off this planet. So if you want to think about the importance of space flight and the importance of ET and what, what uh, UFOs and what their capabilities are, we're going to have to develop them too. So let's put it in that context that we are evolving on this particular star system, in this Milky Way, this galaxy we call the Milky Way. And we have another few billion years left of life on this, and then we have to be out of here. So in our generation, we have begun the process of leaving the planet. I invite you to think back in time. A few thousand years ago, if you've studied your history, the Phoenicians were the first to build ships and start to explore the Mediterranean Sea. And sometime in about that time, same time frame, South Sea Islanders in their dugout canoes started exploring the vast Pacific. And humans have been walking, we think, from the beginnings in Africa across this planet on foot all before that time and expanding themselves across this globe. And our previous generation, my parents' generation, developed going into the air. And my generation, our generation, left the planet altogether and started exploring beyond. So exploring, reaching out, understanding is what we're really all about, if we're going to survive. And that's our choice. And. The beauty of all of this is that it is our choice. And Colin made some very powerful statements up here about the power of consciousness. Now, you younger people, I'm going to give a little history here so that you understand the context in with which we are operating. In the historical setting, <clears throat> Our science, as we are developing and understanding it, only began about 400 years ago in our Western civilization. <clears throat> and it began, fortunately, when the philosopher of that period, Rene Descartes, how many of you young people even know the name? Not very many of you. When the philosopher Rene Descartes, a writer, brilliant man, prince of the church, came to the conclusion that body, mind, physicality, spirituality belong to two different realms of reality. And that got promulgated and accepted by the church, by the Catholic Church. The noble part of that is it got the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, off the backs of the intellectuals of the 16th and 17th century. And they quit burning them at the stake for disagreeing with the church. That allowed science 
as we understand it, to start to arise in the 16th and 17th century with Isaac Newton and the early greats. The downside was that science arose strictly as a materialist, reductionist concept. Spirituality, mind, consciousness was not involved at all and has not been involved since those Cartesian days almost 400 years ago. So the science that you learned in school and have until now was built upon the thinking of the last 400 years of strictly materialist concepts. And the beginning of quantum mechanics and the work of uh, <clears throat> Einstein, Bohr, Planck at the end of the 19th, early part of the 20th century set the stage for the development of quantum mechanics in the 1920s, which showed that, that uh, Descartes was wrong. The Cartesian duality that said body, mind, physicality, spirituality don't interact is just dead wrong. We have demonstrated over and over again, just in the last 10 years or so, 15 years at most, that mind-body does interact. Now, that's been known for some time. But throughout the 20th century, from those beginnings, meager beginnings in the 1920s, science, physicists particularly, and biologists have insisted that quantum mechanics only pertain to subatomic matter. It didn't pertain to us. It didn't pertain to our scale size. It didn't pertain to really this reality, only to subatomic matter. Wrong, dead wrong. We have now demonstrated completely and thoroughly and a part of it was touched upon by Colin here. The fact that the principles of quantum mechanics called entanglement and resonance and non-locality pertain to everything in the proper fashion. And most of the phenomenon that we were talking about and most of the phenomenon that have come out of the past in the so-called mystical experiences are directly related to the quantum world and our body mind and our thinking and our consciousness is fundamentally a quantum process i will say to you to help get this idea across in the english language we call the intuition our sixth sense now this should be called our first sense because because it's rooted in the quantum world and the quantum world was around and the quantum information world was around long before this planet, we and our solar system even existed. It existed in the very basic nature of matter. Our normal sensory mechanisms, our sight, our, our sound is uh, as a result of the type of atmosphere we have and our bodies have evolved to utilize the sound and hear and get information that way. Our vision is based upon the fact that we have solar flux on this planet and our bodies have adopted, adapted, and our mind, uh, main, brain, mind, body have adapted to utilize that information. And so it goes with touch and all the rest of our, our sensory mechanisms. And they are, we can demonstrate now very clearly and I won't go into the technicalities of it, but that all of these senses are based upon a relationship with the quantum world. And so even though at this very moment in time, the great frontier science that needs to be healed and needs to be brought together is the gap and the disagreement and the conflict between Einstein's general rel relativity and the non-local world of quantum physics. Right now, that is the key scientific issue that needs to be resolved. And we're working on it as hard as we can, but it's a tough one to crack. And we do have people working on it all over the world, and they know it's a problem. And I'm sure it pertains to the very problems that Colin was talking about with the crop circles and the voices and the noises because that we don't understand we don't know how to fit them into it. We don't know how the UFO phenomenon fits into it, uh, but nevertheless, it does. Now, I'm going to shift gears here at this point, having set up 
the stage for what we're talking about here and tell you my experience uh, and how I got into the UFO bit. And uh, 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 Colin pointed out, he and I and others will be at the Disclosure Conference in Gaithersburg, Maryland, just next week, hoping to open this a bit further. Uh, our U.S. government has been the laggard and the slowest government around to start to open up these these very issues. <clears throat> and it's not at all clear at this point exactly where the hang-up is and who's holding it up, but uh, it is still being held up. Now, some of us have suspicions. We think we know a little bit, but we don't know a lot about how to do this. <clears throat> I grew up in Roswell, New Mexico, which, <laughs> which as uh, all of you know from your laughter, has something to do with the UFO a bit. And I was a senior in high school, or getting ready to be a senior in high school, in July 1947, when the so-called Roswell incident took place. <clears throat> I didn't think much of it at that time. Uh, my people uh, were reasonably successful cattle people, and uh, we had farm machinery dealerships and ranches and farms, and knew everybody in the whole Pecos Valley, with my grandfather being the patriarch of the family, and his sons, my father and uncles, uh, running and managing the businesses. So we knew everybody in the whole area of up and down the Pecos Valley, <clears throat> including some people at Walker Air, what now is Walker Air Force Base, uh, which was the Air Force Base associated with the uh, Roswell incident, and uh, Jesse Marcel, the major from the Air Force Base who was the first officer on site. Well, I also, we also had a friend who was a major in the administration at the same base who happened to be one of my sources on all of this. <clears throat> Anyhow, I didn't think a lot about that at that point in time. I was too busy being a kid and getting ready to go off to school. And <clears throat> it appeared in the Roswell Daily Record one day, and I still have copies of all of this, uh, that a, a UFO had crashed or an alien spacecraft had crashed uh, not too far away. And the next day uh, it came out, the Roswell data record uh, corrected it and said, at least they thought they corrected it, under government uh, requirements to say, no, it was really a, a balloon, a weather balloon that had crashed. <coughs> and uh, so one here today, gone tomorrow was, was the story of UFOs. Now, the interesting point to jump ahead a little bit, over the years, the story of what it was that happened at Roswell has changed at least a dozen times since 1947. Now, if it were anything but a cover-up or what it was, one, one accurate story would have been sufficient. But in the, the, the cover-up stories have been numerous, uh, half a dozen to a dozen, in the last 60-some years. And that in itself should be enough evidence that uh, something really went on. Anyhow, I didn't think a lot about that at that point because I went off to uh, college to get my uh, get an education. <clears throat> And then to start my life, and I wasn't going to, wasn't going to be a farmer. I got, had hay fever, so I couldn't. I wasn't going to bale hay the rest of my life. So I was headed for a career in industry. But this was during the years of the Korean War, and so the government had a slightly different plan in mind. The draft board. When I graduated from Carnegie in 1951, and went back to work. Um, started to go back to work with my father on the ranch for the time because my grandfather was ill and dad had asked me to come back and work with him. And the draft, draft board said, hey, we want you to go to the Korean War. Uh, I said, well, you may want that, but I don't. And it so happens I would started flying when I was 13 years old by washing airplanes on the local flight line when dad, dad let me off from punching cattle and uh, putting machinery together. And so I had my pilot's license by the time I was 16. And if I was going to go into the military in the Korean War, I wanted to be a pilot. So instead of being drafted, I enlisted in the Navy, uh, went to boot camp in San Diego, uh, then went off and to, uh, uh, then went and got my commission with the Navy and applied for Navy flight school, which I received, and went off, became a Navy pilot, and was serving my time in the Navy paying for my uh, 
Navy's wings and serving my obligated service. The Korean War was ending by that time. And I was aboard an aircraft carrier in the Pacific coming home to test pilot duty. I was pretty good at what I did. And so I was assigned to test pilot duty in 1957 coming home from the Pacific. And you know what happened on October the 4th, 1957. Sputnik went up. And I realized that humans would be right behind robot spacecraft. And I thought, hey, that sounds like a pretty interesting thing. And my natural proclivity as a person asking irreverent questions about what's reality all about, decided that would be a good place to go, try to do to find out. So I immediately set my cap toward being an astronaut, although the word had not been invented at that point because I knew humans would be right there. It was invented in the next few months. But uh, I chose in October of 1957 on the way back from uh, the Pacific aboard a carrier to uh, change my career path, be a test pilot, get more education, and hopefully be selected into the astronaut program. And that did indeed happen in 1966, almost nine years later. When uh, I was selected, I was at Edwards Air Force Base as an, instru an instructor in the, in the uh, test pilot school and got the privilege of going through the space portion of the school at that point and selecting the astronaut program from there. So, but I want to point out, and this is bearing on some of the things we're talking about here. I want you young people to know, that was over 50 years ago, 52 years ago now, that our knowledge of what the universe was all about in the general public at that point in time was about as sophisticated as God in the heavens, man in the middle, and everything else below. We really didn't know doodly squat about what is out there. And we know an awful lot more now thanks to going into space, particularly thanks to the Hubble telescope, particularly thanks to the magnificent images that are now being brought back over the last 10 years that help us see the universe in ways our ancestors and in even our parents, certainly my parents, and even myself as a youngster growing up, had no idea what the universe was really like from what we are now seeing from these magnificent pictures coming back from Hubble. They blow us away. From The astronomers are just flipping out over it. Those of us with a pretty good education in astronomy and astrophysics are doing the same thing because the universe is, being, is bigger, more complex, more magnificent, more awesome, more problematic with feedback loops and things that classical science and classical thinking simply cannot explain. And I will say to you, that probably one of the sacred cows of our 20th century that thought was explaining the way the universe arose, namely the Big Bang Theory of how it all came about, is probably dead wrong. It's not the right one. Fred Hoyle, the British astronomer, was probably correct that we live in a universe that has a continuous creation of matter in this relatively steady state creation of matter type universe. Now that puts a whole new twists on everything we've thought about. Now let's add in the fact that we have visitors and the uh, visitors clearly from all the evidence that I have seen and been a part of are not of this world. Now to continue my little story that some of you don't know, most of you don't know, when I came back from space and being an astronaut and uh, being pretty well knowledgeable in these areas. And oh, by the way, and I did get a, get a doctor's degree from MIT in aeronautics and astronautics back in the days when, uh, as I just said, our knowledge of space was God in the heavens, man in the middle, and everything else below. Uh, but we were probing and trying to learn something. And I did get uh, my PhD from MIT and in aeronautics and astronautics because at the very beginning of the space program, 
we did realize, and our government did realize, that we didn't know anything about space. And we did, if we're going to go into it, we better have some people that knew what we knew. And so do doctoral programs and graduate programs were set up beginning at MIT, Princeton, and Caltech. Those were the first ones. And I was privileged to be in some of those first classes that went through and got advanced degrees. And that served me well. However, and Fred Hoyle pointed out, Fred Hoyle pointed out in that period when we first went into space, he said, if we ever get a picture of Earth from space, life will never be the same again. And he was right. Because as we've looked back at Earth like this, this tiny little ball that you can put your thumb up and blot it out. And those of us who have privileged, been privileged to have that experience, life hasn't been the same again. And in my particular case, just briefly, <clears throat> since I was lunar module pilot on the third lunar landing, the first <clears throat> landing uh, to do science on the moon, the very first lunar landing was just to prove that we could do it and get back off. That was Apollo 11. <laughs> Apollo, well, that was their mission, prove we could do it and safely get back. Apollo 12, was to prove we could land precisely where we wanted to land and get back because Apollo 11 had find, had a little trouble finding a good landing spot. And uh, so that left us. And oh, I was Apollo 14. As you remember, Apollo 13, If you did you see the movie Apollo 13? Many of you did. Well, Apollo 13 was my original flight. And uh, because I had served served on Apollo 10, but with Gordon Cooper. And our policy was after you served as backup, and that was you started out, you served as a backup crew for a mission, and then you could go to a prime crew. Well, I served as backup on Apollo 10, which meant I could go and be a prime crew on Apollo 13. And I served backup with Colonel Gordon Cooper, who, by the way, also was one of the first to say that he had had UFO experience and while he was in the Air Force before astronaut experience. Anyhow, he retired from the program after Apollo 10 back up, and I was slated for Apollo 13, and Alan Shepard, uh, who had been our first man in space, who had been grounded because of Meniere syndrome, but had that corrected, and had come back on flight status and was assigned to Apollo 13 with me. And uh, this was approved by Houston, but headquarters NASA said, Alan, you've been grounded and not flying for a few years. Perhaps best take a little more time to train. So we switched mission with Jim Lovell and his crew, which was Apollo 14. They took 13, we took 14. We didn't like that, but they got the bad machine, we got a good machine. And uh, we went on to the Apollo 13 landing site. So <clears throat> my mission was then Apollo 13 slash 14. And the good part of that was that I was on the ground with Ken Mattingly, who, those of us who know the little Apollo 13 history, got bumped from Apollo 13 at the last minute because he had been exposed to Charlie Duke's measles, or one of the, his children's measles, one of the other astronauts. And the medics thought, was afraid he'd come down with measles in flight. So he was a substitute, his backup had to substitute for him. That left Ken and I on the ground as the lead lunar module and command module pilots in NASA when the Apollo 13 explosion took place. Our job was to be in the simulators working out the problems they had to work out because the, li the lunar module had to be a lifeboat, a tugboat, to bring them home. That was my machine. I was lunar module pilot. Ken Manningly had to figure out how to get the command module back in through the atmosphere with not enough energy because the energy, the power source had been ex destroyed by the explosion in space. So our job was crucial then to helping get the Apollo 13 mission home. And then I went on as a lunar module pilot for Apollo 14. But my point I was going to make here, on the way home, after all the work was done, and coming back from the moon, and being able to rotate to keep thermal balance on the spacecraft. We were rotating to keep 
balance on the spacecraft, which allowed every two minutes a 360-degree panorama of Earth, Moon, Sun, and a 360-degree panorama of the heavens. Wow. That blows you away. And what happened, and this has happened to all of us in one form or another, I've probably been a little more vocal about it than others, some of the others, and my experience with getting my PhD in astronomy and astrophysics helped enhance my appreciation of it. <clears throat> but <clears throat> from space, when you were in space, the star systems, the heavens, are 10 times as bright, 10 times as many stars as when you, what you can see on Earth on the highest mountain on the clearest night. And that's because of the intervening atmosphere, which looks like a little thin rind around the Earth when you see it from a distance. Here's this magnificent blue and white Earth and this little rim of atmosphere that keeps away the solar particles and things that allow us to have a, 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 a atmosphere free of these particles that could be de devastating to us as living systems. <clears throat> In any event, coming home and being able to look at all of that was overwhelming. It blows you away, and it did me. I suddenly realized <clears throat> from my studies at Harvard and MIT that the molecules of my body and the molecules in the body of the spacecraft and in my partner's bodies were manufactured in some ancient generation of stars, because that's where matter is made in the furnace of star systems. And suddenly those were my molecules, not intellectually, but viscerally. Wow. A visceral experience of unity with star systems. All is one. The first notion came out of that. And it was so, <clears throat> This continued every time I had a little break from my duties and got to look out the window and see this panorama, such that when I came home, I had to find out what in the world was this experience. I've never had anything like this before. <clears throat> and of course, I found nothing in the, uh, started searching for it, nothing in the science literature and nothing in the religious literature. So I have to, had to go to some, uh, uh, professors in a nearby university to help me search it out. But one more point, as I was coming back, I realized that we humans have been asking the question forever, as long as we've been sentient beings, and looking into the heavens and saying, what is this? What is my relationship to all of this? What in the world? Who am I? How did I get here? Where is this all going? And that reoccurred, of course, coming back from the moon. And I realized that is the first generation of spacefarers, perhaps we started to need to ask that series of questions all over again, because seeing it from this perspective was a totally, completely new experience. And <clears throat> my friends over at Rice University in Houston, whom I'd asked, helped me understand what this experience was about, came back a few weeks later, and out of the Sanskrit, they said, we found something that may fit. And I said, what is it? They called it Salvakapa Samadhi. What is that? I said, what is that? That's the experience where you see things, and it comes out of the Sanskrit, ancient Sanskrit. It's an experience where you see things just like they are separately, but you experience them viscerally as a unity, a oneness internally, accompanied by ecstasy. Now, we have different languages, names for that in different languages. Coming out of Greek, it's a metanoia, change of heart, uh, Satori, out of the Zen, it means a total change in the way you see and experience things. And a blissful acknowledgement, a blissful experience of unity with the universe. And that was the nature of the experience. And that also made me realize, back to where we started on this, <clears throat> that one of the places where we in science were totally derelict was that we had promulgated this Cartesian duality for almost 400 years and for almost 100 years in the 20th century after the frontier was saying, hey, that's not right. We've got to have something different. And so only now 
in the last in the closing years of the 20th, 20th century and of the 21st century have been, a, been able to see within quantum science and large portion of it is thanks to Noetic, the Noetic Foundation I set up, who has been researching mind, belief system, these types of experiences. And we're to, we still don't have a great understanding of consciousness because, as Colin pointed out, it is a very complex subject. It starts with awareness. We are aware. In the English language, consciousness at its fundamental level is awareness. But it's much more complex than that. We know that all animals are conscious. We've now had experiments that know that all plants are conscious. We know that all matter to some level is conscious because one of the first definitions that comes out of quantum mechanics is the idea that two particles that are in process together and subsequently go across the universe from each other, that they maintain quantum correlation. Now we in science have called that for 80 years now, that one particle quote unquote knows what happens to the other particle if you do something to it instantaneously. That is the definition of quantum correlation and entanglement. My contribution here is to say, take away the quotation marks. One particle does know what the other particle is doing. It is the very basis, the most fundamental definition of consciousness that we have. In other words, at the particle level, at the photon level, if they are quantum entangled, there is some information being transferred. And that is one of the flaws that 20th century quantum mechanics said is that information can't be transferred in this way. So we've devised all sorts of ways to get that information around. But it is very simple. That is the basis of our intuitive experience. That entangled, we're entangled with everything in the universe. And our subjective intuitive experience is the basis of it. And it is entangled with other, all of our other sensory mechanisms as well. So a, an entirely new definition of sensing is having to arise out of this basic experience. Now, it's slow going. We haven't converted yet the entire world, or even the world of science. But let me point out to you what we are trying to do. In trying to understand consciousness, <clears throat> At one extreme is the Greek philosophic idea of idealism. And it even goes back before the Greeks, but the, uh, the Greeks <coughs> uh, formalized it. And on one, at this is extreme idealism, which says that consciousness is the only stuff, and matter is simply a thought in universal consciousness. If you want to call that God, that's okay. <coughs> but that matter is simply a thought in the mind of universal consciousness. Okay, that's one extreme. The other extreme on the other side is scientific materialism that says that consciousness is simply an epiphenomenon of the collision of particles and we are conscious by accident. Okay, here are the two extremes. And I take the position they're probably both wrong. Somewhere in between, somewhere in between, we will find reality as we experience. And that's what science is all about. Test, theorize, test, experiment, and slowly squeeze down your definitions till you don't have anomalies coming out of your theoretical structure. But science progresses by theorizing, testing, and then finding anomalies that says, oops, our theory isn't quite good enough yet. Do some more theorizing, test, and we'll keep squeezing it down. But at this point in time, as I said at the beginning of my talk, we are still just barely out of the trees. We think we're pretty smart. And we are in many ways. In this last hundred years, we have done some pretty amazing things. However, let's go a little further. 
at the beginning of the 20th century. There were just about, just under two billion people on this planet. Do thanks to, to the science and the medical science in particular of the late 19th and throughout the 20th century and in, now into the 21st century. The population has exploded from two billion people at the beginning of the 20th century to six and a half billion people at the end of the 20th century, a threefold, over a threefold increase. And the best evidence suggests to us <clears throat> that the planet with all of its magnificent resources can sustain with the lifestyles of the industrial societies only two billion people. So we are in deep trouble with sustaining our civilization as we understand it and something's got to give and it's up to us to cause it to happen. So to tie in a little closer to what Colin has been saying, <clears throat> I told you my experience with, with Roswell. I did take this knowledge that I had learned when I came back when I came back from the from the moon, many of the old timers, what I called old timers in Roswell, who had been there at the time and involved. They were some of them in the uh, police force, the sheriff's department, some at the military base, some undertakers, some coffin makers. Uh, after I came back from space and was lecturing around and visiting back home. Uh, some of them came to me and pulled me aside and told me their story, that they had been shut up after the Roswell incident, and they were now older. They didn't want to take their story to the grave, and they wanted it out. And they figured I was trustworthy since I was a local boy and been to the moon. It would be okay if I took their story. So I promised them I wouldn't tell their names, but I would carry their story forward. A few years ago, 10 years ago, I did take the story to the Pentagon. I did have a meeting with high-level intelligence people as Joint Chiefs of Staff. I did tell the story with a couple of other, uh, with another naval officer and Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer, if you've heard that name, and uh, told my story of what I knew about the Roswell incident, and uh, subsequently had it confirmed that it was true and that the uh, individual the individual who I told this with uh, had tried to get into it to find out personally about the information, and he was rejected, as many others have been rejected, to have first-hand knowledge of, of the cover-up. In any event, however, the fact that the Roswell incident was real has been confirmed. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's primarily what I wanted to tell you, to say to you here today, to say that all of this wonderful stuff that Colin has presented to you today is real stuff. We know it's real. We don't know all of the mechanics that go into how it comes about, whether indeed our alien visitors are uh, causing it, whether it's an interaction in the collective unconscious that's causing it, whether it's a little bit of both. Uh, but it, nevertheless, it is a phenomenon that deserves our attention because it's trying to tell us something. And right now, we need to learn a lot about who we are, where we are, what, where we're going, and what this is all about because we're not on a sustainable path as a civilization. Now, let me add one more thing. We have demonstrated over and over and over in the laboratory that this consciousness phenomenon <clears throat> whether it be with plants, animals, particles, is a non-local phenomenon. It goes across uh, Faraday cage barriers. And now, those of you with a little electrical engineering or physics engineering, okay. ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of Thank you very much. We'll take your <laughs>
Okay, so Colin Andrews again and Edgar Mitchell. Um, I'm sure you have stuff to talk about. Okay. Does that one work good enough? We'll kind of push them back and forth. Okay, who's got questions? Well, do you, want, do you have a question for Colin? Or do you have a, about his experience in space? I mean, uh, there, there would be, uh, yeah, please yeah, ask. Okay. yeah, there would be many, of course, but uh, at the very basic level, I've always kind of been intrigued to wonder, in a normal day in space, in a normal night, I mean, what happens? You kind of turn the lights off and go to sleep? <laughs> How does that kind of work? Yeah. Uh, when we were in space, the uh, one, one person was on duty all the time, on the radio all the time. The other two of us could go to sleep. And we had uh, hammocks underneath our couches. You could go down there. We'd dim the cabin light, but then you had to sleep and go to sleep. So uh, that was just training, just tired, just sure. tired. So you could, go to, you could do that. And how many kind of hours would they tax? Well, we, uh, we carved out about uh, nine hours for sleep and housekeeping and eating and all that sort of thing. The rest of the time, we were flying in spacecraft and doing experiments and that sort of thing. question for you, if it's the one we both really need answers to, is uh, just how much, what is the relationship between the UFO phenomenon, our visitation, and the crop circles, which is something we all really want to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it is, for me, the hardest one. It's the hardest one to answer. I, I, I kind of try constantly to engage my intuitive that you were referring to it, the first sense, yeah. uh, because I think that is important. We all have it. Um, it's what do we feel is happening? What do we think you know, is happening? Um, I, I, I can't explain, uh, you know, I, I can't say that I, I'm any closer to knowing the physical energies that are involved and how they're deployed. I feel much closer to uh, the fact that it's almost a, almost a joint mind at work, that what we need to know and where we need to go is we're being inched along, like, like they're kind of holding our jackets, you know. We, we started with a simple circle. Do you see the circle? Do you see now we've got two circles? Do you see we've got a ring around them now? You know, and then we start interactive kind of process. It's like these pulling along. And way down the road, 25 years it took to reach a place where we then begin to question one another. If you made a circle, and I'm the observer, I'm the researcher, and you're telling me you saw this. Well, that's funny. That's what I saw. And now, we're, now both factions are beginning to open up the debate. So it, it becomes a wider situation. I was interested that you mentioned uh, some of the manifestations of the UFO phenomenon, like the orbs yeah. and things like that. I've, <clears throat> I've worked with, uh, of course, I've worked with healers. And uh, this audience, some of you in this audience may know, I have used un. Uh, natural techniques for prostate cancer and kidney cancer um, and successfully whipped that. And I've also worked with a young healer, and I've been a student of the process, this young healer in Canada by the name of Adam, the healer in Vancouver. He's quite a phenomenon. He's a, he's a, he's a young man. He's, he's not really in practice right now. He's trying to finish his education. But uh, uh, I have worked with his father, and he has on many occasions, when his father would go for a walk with him in the evening, the orbs swimming all around him. Now, and I'm convinced what they're dealing with, because we know they can change shape into a lot of other things. And I'm convinced that is a cloaking device, that they have a capability, uh, because in the UFO phenomenon, people have observed these things there, then suddenly take off and suddenly disappear, disappear yeah. just disappear. Well, that's a cloaking device. They're, they're changing something yeah. that changes the ability to perceive. Right. So they look something different. Right. And we're, we've got some of that. In the military, we have some of that. We have some cloaking device, but not anything like the aliens yeah. have. It, it's outside the yeah. yeah I, I would kind of um, throw this in the equation as well, Edgar, that uh, I was with Stephen Greer, who you will know. Um, one particular evening in, in southern England, we were uh, out there basically giving him an opportunity to demonstrate that he had claimed uh, on many occasions. Bring them in, huh? 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to be able to vector into position UFOs, etc. Well, um, I, I will say that I was somewhat skeptical, uh, but nonetheless, I was with him and 50 other people. We were on a hillside, and uh, what I witnessed, excuse me, this is a ear, this is this ear problem. Um, that he, uh, we, we were 50 of us there, and and, and uh, allowing him to kind of basically take the lead on this vectoring business. But what was witnessed was that half of this group, and of which I was one half, and this group over here, in kind of intermingled, but the, of 50, 25 witnessed this uh, red light that cut through the base of the cloud at high speed. It was a cloudy night, low clouds, stratus cloud. And it came through the bottom. It actually illuminated the cloud from within. So we couldn't see structure. We could see that it was roughly oval, uh, coming through at speed. And as it got almost overhead, it separated two ways. Half went this side and half the other. What was particularly interesting to me, and I'm amazed that we've not kind of seen some take up on this, because of the half of the group, my half saw a red light, cherry red, Pronounced cherry red, cut into heading like that. The other half, who are all right here, I mean, in the same place, as if they're wired differently, saw a bright white light, and it's very, very different, very different, again doing the same thing. So we're looking at the same object. This is whether perceptive, whether we're wired differently, it's hard to know. But uh, it's all, it's all in there. It's all in there. And there is quite a bit of evidence to suggest that that is quite true. Uh, the current phenomenon of the indigo children these days are suggesting they're wired a bit differently than we are. And I know a few of those young people, and they are, yeah, they're, they're pretty interesting. And uh, there are some that claim, and that there's among ETs among us. And uh, maybe so, I don't know, personally know that, but uh, there are some that claim that, and that indeed they do have a different perceptual mechanism. Yeah, I, I think too, if I may, <laughs> just to add to that, uh, it kind of bounces off of one another here. It, uh, there was a slide that I was intending to show the audience um, that we, we had there a, a clairvoyant, a medium in, in England by the name of Isabel Kingston who had claimed, does continue to claim, that she could look at a crop circle and see aura layers of colors, banding of colors, concentric rings around the, the circle within and external to it that in exact relationship to the boundary of the circle. And she will describe this in the widths, in the coloring. Well, we with Masahiro Kahata, who is here, I saw Masahiro come in, is the inventor of the equipment, the IBVA brain measuring equipment. We measured a whole range of individuals, um, professionals, skeptics, um, mediums, just open-minded people. And what we found with this medium, Isabel Kingston, why I certainly didn't feel it was the wisest thing to completely dis discredit her or to ignore her information was that what we had there and Masahiro could add to that if he wishes was that all of the from alpha beta delta all of the frequencies being measured both hemispher hemispheres of the brain in coherence on both sides of the brain were way above in, in magnitude power magnitude uh, higher magnitude, yeah. I mean, the, the, I, as I say, I do have it in the computer and I was going to show it. But so that there is what I'm really saying is that we, we are kind of able to measure uh, at some level uh, something different about some individuals than others who are giving us different information to others. And so, you know, I think, I think this is very much a time to open this up. It, it is a matter of opening it up and, and heading down that, that, that road. Uh, just, I'm going to talk, open it to you guys here in just a minute, but one more point I wanted to make is that uh, there are some studies that I have been doing at this point and continue to deepen, want to deepen, is that <clears throat> there are some of these sensitive people that I work with that claim there are ET frequencies. Now, exactly what they mean by that, I don't know. However, I have been privileged to experience having energy 
sent to me and feeling a vibration with that. Have you, have you experienced it? Yeah. And it feels like a little motor running inside, or like a cat purring or something like that. But they claim that some of this is ET frequencies. Well, I'm devoted to trying to find, okay, using our frequency analyzers, extending them to the point, trying to define some of these frequencies that are claimed to come through this way. And I, I don't know how we're going to do that yet, but maybe we can do it. We've got to do it. Yeah, we've got to do it. Okay, it's all yours. Uh, yeah. Um, my question, though, to both of you, it seems like there is an evolution to consciousness that's happening to the crop circle phenomena and to the UFO phenomena. Is, do you feel this is culminating in, let's say, the 2012? Uh, Colin just wrote a book called The Idiot's Guide to 2012. Well, people are trying his, to link it there. I don't know what it's happening. And so I'm just wondering, are you seeing this reaching a culmination point as we combine consciousness, crop circles, UFOs together? Well, I think we're probably, as, as Colin was pointing out, we all perceive things and interpret them a little bit differently. I don't give much credence to 2012, but uh, nevertheless, it is quite clear that things are at a crunch point that are particularly because of, because of our uh, <clears throat> sustainability, the sustainability issues we're up against. So it better be at a crunch point. We better consider it a crunch point. And as I said, this has got to start from the bottom up, so we better get busy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say I expected this to come up <laughs> with our discussion. Uh, and of course, the 2012 is, is a very popular subject, and frankly, it needs to be. Um, I was asked with my wife, Cynthia, to uh, co-write for the Complete Idiot's Guide, and I I apologize for the title, of course, of which we had nothing to do with it. The Complete Idiot's Guide series, as you know, by Penguin Books. We were asked to write research last year, wrote and published in October of last year, the 2012. So that's the Complete Idiot's Guide to 2012. There's a lot out there about it, and I learned a lot in the research for that book and became totally convinced that the astronomers, the Mayan astronomers, were brilliant. And the, here's the starting point, and, uh, at which it, it got me latched in very quickly. If you doubt there's anything in the 2012 prophecy, have a look. Page 90 of the book for whoever's got it. You will see in the sky, in the northern and southern hemisphere of this planet, at 11-11, 21st of December, 2012, an arc, a semi-ring of planets across the sky with the white horse above it. Now, they knew something. This is an extraordinary arrangement of planets, which we have not seen before, like for many, 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 many years, beyond, beyond our time and our fathers and fathers before. They knew something. Now, if they knew that, then I want to know more. And so we start, <laughs> yeah, that's right, we better know. But just very, very briefly to say that that then took us into looking at other trend factors and the trend factors of population explosion, material requirements of the population, looking at Solar Flare 24, this is heading in now, that NASA themselves have some concerns at the 100-year quietness of the sun, which might bode very badly for the maximum, which comes at 2012, and other factors which are in on the website for anybody who wants to take that further. When you look at all these crossovers of evolution in design, of our involvement and interaction with people, the other factor lines, as Edgar is saying, we on this planet as a species and a culture are in a hurry. We're in a hurry because like any species of the other species, rats suck in a cage. You can overpopulate them and immediately they start to behave and do things differently. Their wiring takes on a different form. We are no different. We, we, that we cannot sustain. 2012, incidentally, also triggers up 7 billion people. You can't do it. We're not going to be able to do it. And that's why we need to be moving on every level right now. And the best way forward is to, for men in particular, I do apologize to the males, of which I am one. We have to, first of all, be able to use and say the word, and then to know it and drop the weapons. We've got to know what love is. And we better learn it fast, because love is the answer to our problems. And we've got to move it forward. In regards to 
Roswell. I can hear you. Go ahead. Lawrence Roswell. Yeah, that's just not a good mic, particularly. Go ahead. In, re in regards to Roswell. I can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, the information that you received, right. Too much. information that you received from your fellow citizens in Roswell, and what did the government say about that, and why are they hiding it? Why what? Why is the government hiding information about Roswell, and what do, what's your story about what Roswell was? Well, there's a long, long history to that that may be debatable, but as I understand it, uh, this goes back to back to, to that period in time. Remember that we were just coming out of World War II in 1947. Uh, the relationship with the Soviet Union was, was the Cold War was just beginning. Uh, no one knew with this revelation or discovery of alien presence. And no one knew were they hostile or otherwise. There was no real experience there. And the Army Air Corps had been separated from the Army and became the U.S. Air Force. They were suddenly in charge of the skies, and they were just now a new independent agency. They didn't really know who's on first. The OSS, the Office of Special Services, which was the intelligence community of World War II, had been disbanded, and the CIA had not been invented yet or been organized yet. So really no one knew what to do with all of this. President Truman, who was Truman, was president at the time, then organized a, a group, and it's, there's a debate about this, but the, the best story at the moment is he, this group was called the Military and Joint Intelligence Committee, which consisted of, of uh, academics, some military people, political people, the best minds he could come together, bring together to take charge of this crash phenomenon and advise what to do with it. And they passed the National Security Act of 1947 that gave the power to do this secretly. And that was the beginning of the secrecy. And it would appear that this group, although they've changed names over the years several times, they haven't abandoned their power, and they've slowly excluded presidents and everybody else from the knowledge. And so uh, those of us that know a little bit about it think it's a travesty. We shouldn't be there, but we are. And that's what the, dis the disclosure process is all about, and I have you know, I've told my story on publicly, and all of a sudden last year I told it publicly on a British radio, yeah. and the darn thing exploded globally. Uh, I don't, I've been saying the same thing for 10 years, but I don't know. All of a sudden it was big news. And it seems to have put a lot of emphasis and, um, and um, muscle into this now disclosure effort. And hopefully uh, we're going to get some, something out of it here very shortly. Yeah, uh, Dr. Carl Shapley here, and you probably knew my father at Harvard, the cosmologist, the astronomer. And so if you were at, at MIT in the 50s, he was the one who proved Einstein's relativity through the redshift in the skies, so you may know all of that. But I'm speaking as an ontologist, because he was the cosmologist, and I grew up with, with uh, astronomy all around me, and as a teenager, I dialogued with Einstein on several occasions to say, really, is the E of E equals MC squared? Is the E not God? And he would pause, because I asked him this several times, and my own ears were hearing Uncle Albert say, well, except that there may be other universes. And that clicked with me immediately. And I don't think Niels Bohr quite got, got him together on the fact that the the unified field theory is interdimensional. That no. it is interdimensional. I'm glad to hear you saying these things. Willis Harmon and I talked about this uh, several times, once in India, and I, I miss him very much, but, and you do, I'm sure, as well. But I would like you to expand something that you're quoted as having said when you came down in that great moment, and that is that the questions are being asked in the wrong way you said that the science should recognize the mystical side 
and that the religions should recognize the evolutionary side. Now, you said it better than I just did here, but I quoted you over India television in, in, in quotes like that and got cheers from many, many of the spiritual people out there who realize that science, skill to know, is knowledge beyond the material universe. And I just thank you so much for what you've been doing, and it's a joy to be here with you in the same room today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, in response, there is uh, an enormous, as uh, we've been saying all afternoon, there's an enormous amount we don't know, and other dimensions is one of them, and the uh, uh, string theory and M theory seem to be falling apart at this, which, which got, went to other dimensions. So all we can say at this point is the future hopefully is going to tell us some answers we don't, we don't have at this point. And, uh, but we still have the problems that we have of reconciling quantum mechanics and general relativity. They both are great theories and they've worked up to a period, but science is about anomalies and finding ways to put together anomalies and test them out. Sure. And that's where we are at this point. Go ahead. Go ahead. Next one. Uh, Mr. An uh, Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Andrews, uh, I want to thank both of you for spending the afternoon with us. It's been, it's been a, 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 an experience. No, it's been very, I, I want to thank both of you for spending the afternoon with us today. It's been very, it's been intense oh, and triggering. I have two questions and maybe Mr. and Colin, maybe you can provide more insight on, on my questions to Mr. Mitchell, but I'm, one of the questions I have is, do you have any insight as to what caused the, um, the alien design and the, um, the disc uh, uh, formation in England and the double helix design? And do you believe that the crop formations are harbingers of world change? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> well, I, th I think inevitably they are harbingers of change, albeit that we are involved in the construction of some of them. Uh, because they are here, uh, my gut feeling tells me it was because they were intended to be. And it's almost like um, they're, 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 uh, to ensure that this was going to happen now on this timeline, they were instilled on us by a mysterious source and instilled upon us by those that construct some. Uh, it, there is an extraordinary um, uh, duo going on here uh, between the, that that people are doing and those that they are not. Uh, I think that they were intended to be here. That was the first thing. So I, th I think they are leading somewhere. With regard to the disc that you are referring to, I don't know how many people will be familiar with that. And Alan raised it on his program too. I hate being uh, the bad guy, but on occasions, if we're going to keep this, you know, let's keep it absolutely uh, truthful, uh, then I have to be the bad guy. I was uh, an advisor to um, the Mel Gibson movie Signs, uh, which I personally felt was abysmal. If I may, I shouldn't be saying that, should I? But I think they <laughs> they could have done a much better job. They could have been much closer to the, the, the very thing that was going on in the fields and the questions that they raised. And of course they cut straight through to the UFO, the ET, and how horrible these things are and they're going to come and destroy us. Uh, it, it was a wasted opportunity as far as I can see. However, getting back to the disc, uh, meetings that were going on uh, in supplying um, the movie screen with backdrops to the launch of the movie and other discussions with their PR people I was told um, that I guess one can share now where the other side of the movie, which I think was just awful, uh, the whole idea was awful, and I said so at the time, that they were in contact contractually with people that were going to construct specific designs that looked like ETs and discs and things like that, that would help promote the money side of this extraordinary situation we have on our planet. You know, where it's money that talks, it seems. You know, that that's the, the, the age that we're just coming out of. And to help sell the movie, they were going to mix the manufacture of, uh, of design by people and leaving the rest of us basically deceived. And that's what Disney were prepared to do to sell a movie. Sorry, but that I have to be the bad guy to tell you that the one that you're referring to that had a lot of people spend a lot of time was made by people in several phases. 
wasn't one like many that we could have shown and have shown, covering 10 acres, extraordinary arrangements that appeared in probably 45 minutes, uh, if, if eyewitnesses are to be believed, uh, probably 15 seconds. I mean, the, the eyewitnesses that I've interviewed, and uh, I've interviewed uh, many that ha claim to have seen circles form. And I, do not, I cannot tell you of one that has described these things forming in more than 15 seconds. That's different from the situation, of course, employing artists over a period of days to construct a design of the kind that clearly interested you. Um, and, and I'm sorry to give you that, that, that uh, answer. I have a question for Edgar. Uh, regarding one of the statements you made about the relationship between consciousness and matter, which one arises out of which? And so my question to you is, have you looked at the uh, ancient Eastern scriptures, uh, particularly those in Sanskrit, because they were able, that literature was able to answer your, um, you know, give you insight about your mystical experience. Uh, have you been looking at those uh, scriptures for answers regarding the relationship? Okay, my, I should have finished telling the story. <clears throat> <clears throat> what we have discovered, of course, what I uh, went on to do research on was looking at these types of experiences in all cultures. And they're, they're in every culture. Uh, and I'm convinced that this type of experience uh, is in every culture. Its interpretation is culture-based, and we call that interpretation religion. So our cultural religions arose from a transcendental, transformational experience, which is a fundamental thing. But our religions have now become mostly a part of the problem, not a part of the solution, uh, because they've gone off in their own political, economic, whatever direction. And that is why in noetics and in my other research activities, I'm more interested in the cosmological point of view of what is it in nature that allows us to have this flip this transitional experience out of ego into self-service, into service to the greater good, which I think is necessary if we're going to reach the sustainability we're looking for. We've got to have that as part of our evolutionary path. And the studies now toward how do we help promulgate or promote these types of experiences and rather than waiting for nature to produce it, when, when in fact what we're seeing in our culture is ultimate greed and self-service that's collapsing our economic system. So how do we turn this around? That is a real question. Okay. Is this on? Go. I can't hear it. My name is here. Nancy Burson. Is that? It? Is it on? Have you got a similar okay. situation? Um, I just wanted to say that I'm very happy to meet you both. I I represent the other side, and many of you here have sat in rooms with me. Just to make it short. I want to use this one. That's what we're Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, my name is Nancy Burson, and some of you have been sitting in rooms with me over the last three years while I show people how to see these light beings that I met in 2004. I began studying with Isabel Kingston in your circles in the year 2000. So I am uh, their ambassador, one of them. Um, I've been, uh, as I say, shown, I have shown people and continue to show people and do events with people so that they can see these really wonderfully loving light beings. And I, and I know that some people, and I just wonder about you guys, because uh, my audiences, when they, come to, when they come to me, they basically say, uh, okay, I'm hearing a few seconds of sound through one ear, particularly the right ear, or I'm seeing little flashes of light. And so we have lots of evidence in that, and there's plenty on my website. Uh, but I also just wanted to say to you guys, you know, thank you for being out there in a way that's, that's really wondrous. And, I, I really appreciate that we're all coming together now. And I also wanted to say that um, a few months ago, actually last summer, uh, I began <laughs> manifesting from them uh, these little gold pellets. And that was three days. And then December, late December, uh, I started manifesting crystals from my body. 
and other manifestations. And these are being used to create water for people's health. And they're now being studied, thank God, after so much time, because there was a researcher whose name, the extracelestials as we call them, was given to me by, by them so that, for the purpose of scientific scrutiny. So now they are being studied by the appropriate authorities. Uh, I would just say, I'd like to know how many people in here have been seeing little flashes of light, as well as, are you seeing flashes of light? Are you hearing through your ear several seconds? I mean, there's a lot of us here who have that phenomena, and that's them. Sure, thank you. Um, maybe we could share that email. Oh, um. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I thank, thank you for stepping forward, because it's not always easy. It's not always easy to, to relay an experience like that and to feel comfortable uh, uh, in so doing. Um, I know for sure there are many people that, are, that make contact, I'm sure with you too, Edgar, uh, who have extraordinary experiences and who are able to utilize information in a real direct and purposeful way that is already benefiting us. Um, I think we, we really are not so far down the road um, um, for us all to feel comfortable with that, uh, with this, this kind of uh, experience and phenomenon. Could I just ask very briefly, um, the, the first time that you had that experience of manifestation, able to manifest, uh, were you given um, a kind of formulae or, 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 or uh, emotional states to, to, to be able to do that? Right. Do, do you see? Right. Do, do you see here? If if we're, if we're prepared to think very laterally, the interaction, the two-way that's going on. That's information that's coming through to you, who is receptive and able to kind of take it this way. But coming back the other way, there are like in spoon bending, the Uri Geller effect. I'm just to very briefly say I was with. Um, Oh, I cannot just, just drop right out of me. A television program uh, producer, uh, I was trying to pull it back. I was with down at a lecture, this is going back some years ago. We were having a discussion in the restaurant. There were other people in there. We were having this discussion and it was one of those situations, we had this conversation coming to this very place here uh, an hour and a half ago, where you know when you really connect with somebody, you kind of, you almost know what they're about to say. You are absolutely dovetailed in. You're connected right there, frequency and emotionally, on the conversation. Quantum resonance. Quantum resonance from the expert here. <laughs> well, what happened, and this is, this is what I'm saying, it's kind of a two-way conversation. The producer said to me, he's listening to what I'm saying, and you know, it, it's kind of like, it, it's, it's unreal, the connectivity that we have going with us. And he then says, but you know, the thing is, Colin, you're a spiritual being. And as he said that, we were eating lunch. We were eating lunch. I have my Caesar salad. And as he said that, we were in resonance with the point he was making. My spoon started going, it, my fork went backwards and forwards, like with the lettuce on the end of it. It's going back like this. And I felt the heat in my hand that was holding it. It was like if anybody that was Reiki, that kind of Reiki heat, that healing heat, the metal bent over, it came back just the twice, and it went back down to a position like this, bent over and solidified. And we just both looked at one another, what just happened? And we said, well, what were we talking about? I said, you just said to me that you're a, you are a spiritual being. And bump, the spoon bent, the, the fork bent. 
So I think there is a two-way going on here. It's, it's what we've already got inside of us and something else prompting us, pulling us along. And we should be grateful that it's there and capable of happening. Well, we won't proceed that. We have some questions from the kids back here. Okay, go. I wanted to, uh, my uh, friend Josh just wanted to, like, uh, we were talking about what other uh, evidence of interactions supposedly with UFOs or any other thing that describes some unusual form of consciousness besides crop circles. Okay. Can like, you hear what he's saying? We can hear the question. What other kind of usual kind of UFO things besides crop circles do you see UFO evidence of? That's how. What other <clears throat> well, besides crop circles, I mean, there is quite a number of direct uh, uh, appearances, like the Phoenix Lights appearance a few, few years ago. Uh, then there was one over uh, Texas just this last year, and the, the press. Pardon? At the Chicago Airport, uh, which these are well re well recognized, credible witnesses talking about, well talked about, and there have been those all along the time, all, all across the last quite a few years. In this recent time. I don't know whether they're appearing more frequently or the media is more willing right. to, to let it out. But they've been going on all along and there are a number of very powerful researchers that uh, <clears throat> like uh, Ryan and uh, uh, the Woods, uh, Robert and Ryan Woods and uh, uh, Stan Friedman, a whole host of very good writers that have been researching these phenomena for years. and. Uh, Okay, yeah, here's Science Illustrated. Okay, I don't know, I haven't really seen this one. But uh, a lot of very good researchers out there that have got books out that should be read if you're really interested in the subject. Okay, another question. These are, these are science students from what, what class are these from, Jane? Aviation High School. Okay, special class here for Edgar Mitchell and Colin Andrews. We're going to ask another question. Um, can Shout into it. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a question specific for Mr. Andrews. Uh, I can't specify which part of your presentation, but did you mention that during one of the circles, the chlor um, the chloroform from the trees were removed? Yes. So I'm sorry, chlorophyll. My my mistake. So okay. So what about the plants? I mean, they were just there without the color. I'm not hearing all of it. I'm hearing the chlorophyll removed. Explain how. They were just plants there without the chlorophyll? Yes. Yes. What, what, what happened was that um, two people, researchers known to me, uh, decided of their own um, volition to construct the two circles you saw on the, side, on the, uh, the slide. They did that. They telephoned me the next day because they felt that in doing this, and the media might pick up on it and have me... Uh, kind of in front of a camera or something, talking uh, about this design. But it wasn't intended to catch anybody out. It was intended to blind test the procedure of plant analysis being carried out here um, in uh, Michigan. That was, the, that was the main reason. And then to see uh, basically how other researchers uh, perceived it, what they got out of it. So, but so it was a test. It point. was a test. It, it was a test. <laughs> That's right. Um, but what happened was that the following day when they told me, I got an aircraft up and immediately, and it was about 10 hours between the construction and what we found in the field was circular areas that, 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 that the plants were not swirled, they were not bent to the, to the ground. They had a direct relationship to the position of those that were made by people and had the chlorophyll simply removed from the plant. There was no chlorophyll, hence why they're that color and not green, the chlorophyll of the plant. And in the field right adjacent to that experiment, which is what it turned out to be, minus the chlorophyll, which had nothing to do with them, a huge design appeared so close to them, you would have thought they might have heard something. It's not known, obviously, the exact timing. They were saying, here, dummy, this is how it's done. <laughs> That's simple. 
Uh, those uh, contactees and ab abductee type guys, do you think there's any validity to that? Any validation to abduction and contactees that are coming out in recent, that have been out? That's a good question. Well, <clears throat> there are so many different stories coming in the literature that it's hard at this point to, uh, to decide which ones are real. Now, Professor John Mack at Harvard, who I knew quite well, uh, all, he could, all he could really uh, attest to was the fact these are sane people telling their stories. They're, these are not nutcases. And of course, he almost, he was challenged by, he was challenged by the professor at, by the professors at Harvard. And he almost lost his position because of it. But I don't think John tried to speak at all, I, uh, speak at all to the validity of what they were saying, but more the fact he was saying, listen to them. They've had an experience. I don't know whether their experience is real, but they've had an experience, and these are not nutcases. And uh, that's all we can really say about it, all I can certainly say about it. And the uh, fact is, Payne Middleton here uh, invited us down to her place, and we had a conference at her place in Carolinas uh, with John and some other some financial people to talk about how do we go about this in, uh, in more efficacious ways. I have, I have a question. Oh, yeah, not at all. Um, I have a section set up for if, if I had time to share with you, uh, which clearly I did not. Um, I think, in fact, I think perhaps I didn't ought to go further with it. I was about to say something that related to a personal experience. And uh, I, sorry, I'm just listening to myself saying may, maybe this shouldn't be right now. But it's, it's something that down the road I, I'd like to share with regard to the abduction situation. So uh, uh, thank you for your presentation today. And uh, Mr. Mitchell, thank you so much for your contribution to the concept of global unity. And that's something that means a lot to me. My organization, We the World, started something called 11 Days of Global Unity. And it's kind of uh, the idea of uh, people coming together in sept every September uh, around the, the, uh, the idea of uh, unity, unity consciousness. I have a very specific question. Um, you mentioned uh, something about feedback phenomena in, in the about universe, and I was wondering what, what you're referring to. Feedback. feedback. Oh, feedback phenomenon, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was using that as a general term. Uh, classical science is primarily linear science. The equation's all linear. Uh, but when you get into the quantum world, you're, you're having to deal in the nonlinear world you're having to deal with feedback devices. Now, we've experienced feedback right here, you know. The sound is feeding into it, it gives you a buzz. Uh, that, that's, but that uh, has been demonstrated over and over now that nature's most important processes are nonlinear. They're very complex processes of nonlinear nature and with feedback devices in it all. Of, I'm not gonna speak to, to individual instances here, but that's where science is going far more complex instead of the very simple linear equations we learned in high school and in college characterizing classical physics. Uh, science, uh, nature's just much more complex than that. So our mod we have to consider our mathematics as modeling, trying to model nature, and we're not terribly good at it yet. And, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, uh, we were talking about crop circles and everything, and the certain one that you went to, it made noise, right? Is there a possibility that underneath the ground there's something that causes that noise to happen? Sorry, excuse me. It is. It's. It's conceivable. We. We have. And uh, most people are not aware that we have actually excavated. Uh, we've had metal detectors and gone looking for. Uh, material uh, un underground. Uh, we have found many human artifacts from a historic, for the historic record, uh, ar archeological goods, but um, nothing more than that. The, 
I think that some that there was a um, there's a result that I, I could share with you quickly, which might also lead to possibly something underground. Although that's personally not where I think it is. We're looking at something above a force that put, pulls plants down. I don't know of it, uh, other than obviously atmospheric pressure as the effect. But you're looking at something that collapses in an energy field that that has the capability of moving plants into position like that. I don't think you're looking at a collapse, which is what you would expect from an underground feature. The reason that I would be interested in going further and looking at underground with regard to magnetism is that in one, and it is only one, remember we've looked at about 10,500. In one, on Ministry of Defense land as it happens, we had a Celtic cross appear where the Earth's magnetic field, uh, the norm, was being exceeded by about 300% and mimicking the actual design in other words, the 300%, the increase in the 300% of the Earth's normal magnetic field mimicked the actual pattern of the design itself. Uh, Dr. John Auburn was doing the analysis of that and in fact was going to also uh, possibly be here today. So in being looking at that and measuring, being, being able to measure the, the effect of the distribution of the magnetic field, we would be looking at a source of about 20 feet underground capable of doing that and being able to calculate the level of magnetism or something invisible creating it 20 feet above ground. So you, you, again, you've, it, you, there is only a question, and it is which. Well, we, we were not there when it was created. We have no idea whether it was a mechanism deliberately executed from above or something that's being manipulated, perhaps underground. Uh, so I, I, that's as much as I can say about that. I think that's all we have time for, but this, this is the anniversary, 20th anniversary of Fion's. What? What's my? OK. Oh, well, it's just, you OK with one more question? Well, OK, one more question. In regards to the Roswell incident, is it true that the government adopted the alien technology to create uh, stuff like the bulletproof vest, the fiber optics, the um, microchip? So that, do, do we have proof that alien technologies develop our own technology? Yeah, yeah. we have proof that alien technology has been put into bulletproof press, lasers, and stuff like reverse engineering. Of well, no, there is uh, some false claims on that. In the Corso book, if that's what you're referring to, Day After Roswell, I believe, uh, uh, Phil Corso it was attributed to him claimed that much of our modern technology came from alien. Uh, there's others that would dispute that, that uh, that really wasn't the case, that it was, we were developing it right here. Now, there may be some at this point alien technology that has been learned and has been developed, but that's a part of the special access program world that we don't really have, can't talk about. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's just to add um, that anybody who is interested in pursuing uh, this new series of uh, basically presentations is a kind of a reboot of the research. Uh, the, the entire archives of the last 26 years of, of my own research uh, will be made available through PDF down files as of tomorrow morning. Uh, on colinandrews.net. And that is not a plug because there were, I'm sure, as always, there will be very little money in it. But colinandrews.net is where you have access uh, uh, in the coming weeks and months to all of the data. And, and, yeah, and Colin, uh, Colin, and, um, and, um, Colin and Edgar will be at the Exopolitics Conference next week. Look up Paradigm Research group uh, next weekend in, in Washington. And there's also CDs of today's event in the back. And the president of Fions here had a uh, comment to make, because this is our party, and we're having a party downstairs. So thank you all very much. And I would like to thank our very, very special presenters. Thank you.